Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Museum for this early coffee talk between Joseph Helfenstein, director of the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas, and Amar Kanvar, uh, artist, uh, consulting artist on this project and part of this project with his amazing piece, uh, Season Outside. It's a great honor. I said that already yesterday. It's a great honor for our museum to host these exhibition experiments with truth, Gandhi, and uh, images of non-violence. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, keep the floor too long this morning. You are here to, uh, uh, for Joseph and Amar. And uh, Joseph, I give you the floor. Thank you. <coughs> And uh, thank you for um, making this possible, for bringing this show here, uh, which um, uh, I hope you will go uh, deeper into because it's a complex project that has taken a long time and includes many different uh, components of world history, really, and religious history and uh, based on Gandhi's idea of uh, nonviolence. Um, and <coughs> so, what uh, one of the most important parts of this long project has been the conversations we ha I had with artists. Uh, there are about um, 10 living artists who have made contributions that are very important for this show. There are more living artists, photographers who are in this project, but Amar Kanvar is the one uh, who is uh, discussion and whose brain and whose knowledge and whose very life really and his, whose very work has been the most important for me. Um, so uh, I discovered his work uh, for the first time in 2002 at the Documenta in Kassel, which is a very big uh, show of international contemporary art, it only happens every five years. And uh, I think it was the first time that your work was shown in a big scale in Europe and uh, to the world, really, to the rest of the world outside of India. Um, his work here, A Season Outside, is, uh, uh, we'll talk about that and some of his other work. So, uh, but this work, The Season Outside, is uh, a season outside is uh, when I saw it, it was really like a revelation. For me, it was like the, the in a way, not conclusion, but the, the very appropriate, very complex, very, very thoughtful and very powerful response of a contemporary artist to the question, the big question, you know, what is nonviolence? How can you live nonviolence? How can you respond to violence? Where is the border between violence and nonviolence? And all of these things. So this show is obviously not an easy show. It's, you know, the topic is extremely complex and it's actually difficult to visualize. But when I saw his piece, it was like, it was really an, an amazing moment. And, uh, and that's when, after that, then we have started to discuss and then finally we met in India and he became a very important component for this project. So let's maybe, uh, I thought, why don't we start with talking about Gandhi? Because uh, this show's title is uh, Experiments with Truth, which is of course based on Gandhi's autobiography, um, uh, Gandhi and Images of Nonviolence. Gandhi is a very complex figure, and Amar knows more about that than probably anyone in this room. So uh, why don't we maybe talk about the complexity or start with the complexity of Gandhi? It's a good start, um, especially when he says that I would probably know more about Gandhi than anybody else here. So. Uh, I think it's not uh, that easy to, uh, you know, to uh, have a grip on the man. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, if you do an experiment, I mean, you do an, like his, his autobiography is Experiments with Truth. The title of this show is Experiments with Truth. And I presume if you do an experiment, you, you have some kind of an hypothesis. Uh, and then you try to kind of experiment to search for it or to prove or disprove it and um, any experiment. And it's not necessary that uh, as you proceed with the experiment, you are likely to get 
uh, results that you expect. You are likely to get all kinds of results uh, in between. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think in a certain way that is what he did. Uh, and as he experimented uh, with the issues that uh, disturbed him, uh, with violent issues of violence and many other things that disturbed him, I think he ran into trouble uh, trying to sort this out, trying to address it, trying to engage with people, trying to communicate, trying to come up with answers and in, in a more immediate sense and dealing. And if you look at his life uh, over a long period of time, you find him uh, continuously um, uh, you know, responding, dealing with his own contradictions that keep on coming up. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, towards the end of his life, he uh, at one point said that uh, when you cremate me, uh, then everything that I have written or said, uh, you know, uh, burn all of that as well. Uh, because uh, there is there's so much rubbish that I have said, uh, you know, that you know, people will think I, this is what I am and this is what I am and that is not what I am, you know, I mean I have, uh, uh, I, in a, so in a sense this is a, this is a um, you know, a person who is, uh, uh, you know, not, it's, it's, it is not very wise to, to treat him as a, uh, uh, as a solid figure with one particular point of view and somebody to, uh, you know, uh, who will prescribe you uh, a way to go. Uh, uh, I do not think that is uh, really, you know, the most exciting thing about him and I think the most exciting thing about him is, uh, is the fact that he, um, he presented a whole set of uh, hypotheses about addressing the question of violence. Uh, he, he presented a, a methodology for dealing with it uh, at a personal level and at a political level and uh, also presented uh, in a practical sense, um, uh, you know, a, a method to engage with this in a real sense, in a political context, in a social context. And, and he tried and he failed and he succeeded and he tried and he failed and he succeeded. But he kept on doing that in a more open way and in some way I think he also kept, um, you know, kept his own fragility, kept his own uh, vulnerability intact uh, and, and, and uh, fought from a position where he retained, uh, 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 you know, unafraid. Uh, of his own vulnerability, even when fighting with an opponent who was much stronger, more powerful, maybe more articulate. And um, so, in that sense, I think what one takes actually is, 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 especially now, is not necessarily only what he said, uh, but is what is, say, my capability or our capability to engage with him. It's 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 more to do with how do we engage with his, uh, s mm, uh, s uh, you could say successes, and for me, I always find it more useful to s to look at repeated failures. If you look at repeated failures over a period of time, then they actually make a lot of sense. Uh, every repeated failure is 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 a step forward in a certain way. And um, so it's about how we we entangle ourselves with this dilemma, uh, with this uh, crisis internally, externally, uh, and address it. And that's the real question. And so it's not figuring him out as much as figuring how do we engage with his his ideas. Has uh, how many of you have read his autobiography? Um, Yes, when I read it, uh, I was a teenager when I read it the first time, and it really became the, the com you know the beginning of this show was really uh, reading his autobiography. One when I read it again more recently, um, one of the things I really always uh, was fascinated about is what you said: the, this kind of uh, try to this attempt to be honest with oneself. Because he was not, he, he does indeed, when he talks about his life, and it's only the first uh, 40 years of his life, it's not the last part where he failed even more. He constantly complains about failing. 
as a as you know he he was not perfect and he he uh, you know he betrayed his father with eating meat and on and on and on and he he was married way too young and he couldn't control his own sexuality and on on and on and on so this i had never uh, read an autobiography of someone con constantly talking about his failures uh, as much and that's i think is actually very that's that's good that's important um, and it contradicts this kind of icon that Gan that Gandhi has become, and but the complexity of Gandhi is also in you know r is rooted in the fact that he was actually killed by one of his own um, you know uh, followers of one of his own faith, the a Hindu. He was killed by what we would call a fundamentalist uh, now, a nationalist, an, a Hindu nationalist. And um, and uh, there is a big discussion in India, and maybe we don't need to go there now because we want to talk about your piece more about Gandhi's role because there's a very strong uh, attempt to write him out of history and to uh, get rid of him, really, get rid of his memory. And um, so, but, but let's not go there um, because this would be another topic maybe with other people talking about it. But when you did your piece, because your piece is also a kind of a, a wrestling with Gandhi, a season outside. You talk about him at the very beginning. How, w how was it then, Gandhi's relevance, and how is it now? Has it changed a lot, or is it sort of are the problems similar? Uh, you know, I mean, the thing that's amazing about um, Gandhi actually is that, um, uh, you know, no matter you know, whatever your position is vis-a-vis -vis him, um, yeah, even if you are, uh, if you take a position that is say, extremely critical of him, um, you find that uh, you cannot do away with him. And the more you engage with anything, any political issue, any social issue, the more you engage with anything around you, uh, you, uh, you have to deal with him. Uh, uh, the more intense is your uh, social political involvement, uh, the more intense you have to deal intensely you have to deal with him and I think that 's his success uh, so um, is there uh, was there relevance uh, of Gandhi then um, yes uh, of course uh, yes is there more relevance of him now uh, you know I think breathtakingly more you know uh, Almost um, uh, in 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 a, it's it's like maybe it's my clarity of the crisis that makes me feel that it's even more uh, you know necessary. Uh, but you just ha only have to look around and try to find an answer. Uh, you look wherever you want. You look in the Middle East. You look in the subcontinent. You look uh, in Africa. Wherever you want to look, you just look and try to come up with a solution. And um, uh, I'm sure you can, uh, but you will have to come back to Gandhi. Yeah. So let's let's go to a season outside. Uh, are, how many of you have already seen the piece? Sorry. Uh, his piece, a season outside. How many? Of, it's a film in the show. How many of you have already seen it? Just very few. Okay. So then, that's, uh, I think it's important for you to know that. So we don't want to go maybe but um, into sort of the too, uh, you know, too, too much detail. But um, how, did you, how did you feel compelled? What uh, sort of made you go to the border, the India-Pakistan border, and sort of, you know, how did you start the piece? You know, uh, sometimes when you begin a work, you don't begin it with a kind of a lofty ideal, you know, in that sense. You don't have some great uh, ambition. You know, sometimes you're just, you, you know, you, you, you're just doing a job and you want to do it as well as you can. Uh, and I think that was also there. Uh, um, I was trying to make a film uh, and, and trying to make a film that, uh, um, yeah, I remember at, at that point I was quite, uh, uh, say, you know, fed up uh, with the whole practice of making films and showing films, and I had, uh, you know, a certain set of uh, cynical uh, kind of thoughts uh, about my profession at that point. 
And, um, yeah, but you were very young. I, uh, I, my problem is I, I kind of continue to feel young, you know, I mean, all the time. So <laughs> it's a bit hard. It, it's, it's, I mean, it's recently I'm beginning to realize that I'm probably not that young. But uh, I didn't think uh, that I was young or old, you know, at that time. I yeah, just, uh, that's the it, sign of being young. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, I've. Um, uh, I must say that at that time I did feel that, uh, you know, I mean, if maybe this would be my last film. Uh, and this is in the late 90s or mid 90s. And um, so I said, if this is going to be my last film, then I might as well, you know, uh, do whatever I feel like. Uh, you know, put everything that I can and everything that I want into it. And, uh, you know, you might as well, you know, go down fighting in a sense. Uh, so, um, and uh, if, if you're not very clear about where you want to go, then it's, it's always uh, good to kind of decide where you don't want to go. And uh, so initially, you know, beginning to work on the film was really about trying to f uh, identify all the things that I didn't want to do uh, in, in, in making the film. Uh, purely as in, in terms of just constructing the film in, in the way that I would want to film, in the manner that I want, the, the places that I want to go, the people that I want to meet, and so on. And so I actually did eliminate uh, uh, several, uh, several options. Um, and um, I also at that point had a sense that, uh, you know, there was uh, and a pretty strong sense, and probably more now, but at that time uh, as well, that there was a, that perhaps I was surrounded by people, um, friends, uh, um, general people, uh, and even relatives and family members, who uh, uh, believed in and even more increasingly were believing in uh, the, uh, n say, the necessary logic uh, of violence even more. Uh, and uh, there was a sense of that, uh, that it was, it was desirable to be violent. It was necessary to be violent. And is that why you went to the border? Uh, I went to the border for, uh, you know, maybe two or three reasons. Um, one reason is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my family uh, in 47, when India was partitioned into India and Pakistan, uh, um, a part of my family was living in, uh, in the region that was in, uh, was now in Pakistan uh, and, and the, the terrible violence that took place. So they had to kind of uh, flee uh, and leave everything behind and come, come into the, say, the Indian side uh, and restart their life. Um, I am from that part, from the from North India, and uh, f there are many, many relatives, friends, uh, families, people who I know who have actually had to flee, um, and they have uh, quite understandably come back uh, or restarted with um, uh, a lot of bitterness and and a lot of anger and a, and a sense of loss. This uh, I'm sure they. Um, they also have, uh, you know, strength that they have gained from all this. But um, this bitterness is also very fertile uh, territory. For violence. For violence, for um, a kind of, um, for, for turning this uh, sense of loss and bitterness into uh, hatred, into uh, perpetual uh, anger. Uh, and so on. And uh, so I have, in a sense, grown up, uh, uh, you know, dealing with uh, this bitterness at uh, minor levels, at major levels, and seen it repeat mm. and so on. Um, I also had the opportunity, uh, the misfortune really, of uh, uh, being in Delhi um, after the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi. and. Um, so, you know, I was a student then, and when the assassination took place, and I mean, there's a that long history. That was in 1984. 84. In 84. I mean, there's a long history to, uh, you know, a se series of events uh, that lead up to, to, you know, why, if one wants to understand why she was assassinated. Uh, 
and there, there were many issues and there was a lot of violence that was taking place in, in Punjab in, in, in some senses unrelated to the, say the India-Pakistan question, uh, but definitely related to questions of identity, sovereignty, language, uh, freedom uh, and so on. Um, and uh, following her assassination, um, um, there were three or four days uh, of uh, massacres, of planned uh, killings of Sikhs because she was shot by uh, her Sikh bodyguards. And um, this was something that as we as young people saw all around us, uh, a kind of un unimaginable brutality suddenly erupting in your neighborhood. Uh, mm. And um, so, uh, and subsequently, I, 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 you know, I mean, I kind of, I did not know how to respond uh, as a young student, but I got involved in relief. I got involved in many things. Uh, immediately after that, in this was, she was killed at the end of October in '84. Immediately after that, in December, um, again, totally unrelated to partition, totally unrelated to uh, anti-Sikh killings or Mrs. Gandhi or Punjab or religion, um, was uh, the gas leak in Bhopal uh, in December, just two months afterwards. And again, you had a large number of people massacred or an accident or, you know, how do you understand this? Immediately after that, uh, uh, you know, I could see that um, there is a, um, a system, uh, whether you want to call it a police system or a state system or a judicial system, but they, they, there is a system that in some sense is protected uh, Union Carbide, uh, mm -hmm. the company responsible for it at that time. Um, it protected the people who killed the, the, the Sikhs after Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. Um, it, it somehow, uh, so why did I go to the border? I went to the border because I felt that it was a, something that was stuck in our throat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this, um, uh, you know, insane geographical division um, that took place. And uh, so in one of the methods that I was trying to make this film was that I, I felt that, uh, you know, let me go as close as I can to those territories mm -hmm. or those zones, either psychological or physical mm -hmm. uh, or geographical, and um, uh, spend some time there to see whether there are any answers that I may find uh, in this dilemma. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, why, that's yeah. how the film begins as well. And in yeah. fact, it begins on the border and ends on the border. And it's, uh, it's really, uh, may, most of you have not seen it, and it's kind of stupid to say anything about it, but it's, it's very powerful and amazing. And it starts, as we said, with the border, with the very line of the border that cannot be crossed. And uh, it's, a, it's a shocking, but powerful. Um, <coughs> now, does that is one of the territories you went to, the border. You also went to a... To the to the sick, uh, mm -hmm. the region where the sick uh, celebrate mm -hmm. uh, their uh, one of their rituals, and you one other uh, place you went to is a Tibetan mm -hmm. uh, refugee camp, also in India, mm -hmm. um, in New Delhi, and in New Delhi. So m maybe would be interesting to talk about these other places, uh, just to give people a, an indication of yeah, yeah. Um, see, I was in a sense. Um, I think in, before I get into the details of, uh, you know, the physicality, you know, why these particular locations or why these particular territories, uh, the only little context that I'd like to give, in, give was, is that when I began to work on the film or on the question of violence, I think subsequently probably with every film that I've done, uh, I have, um, you know, ended up following this method, which is that it was not possible to make a film on violence without understanding, uh, you know, how, what my position would be uh, with violence. Uh, and, um, and so, in a sense, it was necessary to interrogate my own self in as many different ways that I could. 
uh, and interrogate myself uh, personally, you know, psychologically, philosophically, practically, emotionally, um, and um, if if there was any, if I could perhaps get to some resolution or a, or some conclusion at the end of that interrogation, uh, then yes, it may I may have the uh, um, capability uh, or the rationale to to proceed on making the film, uh, and so in the course of doing that. Um, which uh, is, you know, if you do it sincerely, it 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 is it can be a matter of life and death because you do not know how to answer uh, um, many questions, and you have to answer them. So then, what do you do? Uh, in that context, I decided that I would um, I would visit, uh, uh, as I said before, real zones. Uh, and imagined zones, uh, practical zones, psychological zones, uh, physical, geographical zones, um, wherein uh, I felt that I may get some insights into this uh, conundrum or into this acute dilemma of how do you understand violence, how do you respond to brutality, is there a way to respond to it, is there a positive way to respond to it, how do you, you know, uh, how do you find the answers to these questions. And, and so I felt that let me see which are these physical spaces and uh, the first one was I, uh, as I said the border. Um, and the other one was in a, uh, in a in a small town called Roper in 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 Punjab, which is, uh, I mean, it's a long story, and I, I, I wouldn't go uh, into it. And I'm sure you can find a lot of these things on the internet. But um, in the in the uh, in the history of the Sikh community and the Sikh religion, there's a turning point uh, that takes place somewhere in the 16th century, I think. Um, when you have a, a largely a, a pacifist or a, you know a community that uh, formally uh, takes to arms for a whole set of reasons, real reasons or imagined reasons, um, uh, ostensibly to protect themselves, ostensibly to take revenge for crimes committed on their uh, guru and on their uh, on their community and so on. But there is an event, and there is a date, there is a place, there is a location, uh, there is a story, uh, there are a set of events that take place, and uh, wherein it is formally decided, it was formally decided uh, that we shall, you know, to 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 take up arms and permanently take up arms and be, in a sense, uh, ready for uh, uh, for uh, war uh, at every moment. Um, this particular event is is uh, is then celebrated every year, uh, and um, and celebrated. Is that, is that like one of their biggest sort of religious or ri uh, sort of gatherings, or or it's or what's the, the significance of that event? Or is it, yeah. See, yeah, I mean, it is. You can say that it is a religious gathering, no doubt. Um, but um, you know, I mean, we are ca capable of having pure fun, regardless of religion as well. You know, so uh, you know, you can turn a religious gathering into a fair, which can turn into a party, which can turn into a sermon, which can turn into absurdity, which can turn into. Uh, just something to do, which I mean, you know. So I mean, everything happens. It's an it's an incredibly large gathering of mm. people, uh, and they just flow in and flow out of a small town, uh, and um, you know, some people have come for an outing, and some people have come out of faith. Some people have come to see. There are many things happening, yeah. and so on. So it's it's a big event, and you know, hundreds of thousands of people come. But they come every year. It also coincides at the time of the harvest. So there are many yeah. other reasons. But it is it is a, a it is a um, you will see images of it. Uh, it's it's a large event that commemorates uh, the day this community turned from a pacifist community, or, or the day it chose to acquire arms, and. And a set of weapons, 
ancient old weapons of the last guru are displayed, are brought out from, uh, you know, from the, uh, say, uh, wherever they are kept, are brought out and publicly displayed for um, a few minutes or a few hours uh, to the public and you, you take, you, you get a, with, you, you get a look at it, you can take, uh, you know, a, whatever, you can, you know, feel good about it or, or take blessings or, mm. and, and uh, that moment is also shown in, in the film, in the uh, film. sort of in, in the evening, yeah, you know, and yeah, it's on yeah. a balcony and yes. he brings out the sword yeah. and, 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 there's and a, a gun and so on. Now, I mean, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a very powerful argument for taking to arms. Um, and that powerful argument was presented in the 16th century. Uh, um, there are very powerful arguments that are presented subsequently in any nation, in any, uh, at different points in time for taking up arms. Um, and if you just, you know, if you look at, say, uh, you know, any country's uh, national day, for instance, uh, most countries celebrate their national day with the military parade. Uh, and um, so does India, so does Pakistan, so do many other countries. Some have stopped doing it uh, of late as well. Uh, but what else is a military parade but a celebration of weapons? Um, and every, every, um, every national day is, is you celebrate your newer weapons as well. Uh, now, it's very similar to this event. Um, uh, here they are bringing out, you know, three, three swords and a gun uh, of the 16th century and they are celebrating. Here you are bringing out 40 tanks, 30 fighter planes and a whole army and so on. So, yeah, it's, um, in a way, both zones uh, uh, will reveal uh, 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 something about us yeah. and how do you deal with it. So, that's... Maybe just to, because many of you haven't seen the film, <coughs> there's a very important, so there's the film, the, the image component, and it's actually extremely beautiful. Uh, I mean, it's disturbing, but it's very beautiful, the, the way you filmed it, the way you, the colors, the, the dresses of the people, the faces, the dirt, you know, the, the violence in nature, the violence among children, the violence among, uh, you know, Chinese torturing and killing, uh, Tibetan monks and things like that. So it's a very, very powerful and beautiful film. So everything that's visual is very complex and very, it's a poem, it's a film poem. But there's also the sound and uh, Amar speaks himself. He, uh, you hear him kind of thinking and wrestling with this topic of violence and nonviolence. And, um, <coughs> and I, I just wanted to, you know, I, mean, I don't know how much more time we have we have a little more time, yeah, uh, but because we want you to be able to have uh, ask questions also. But uh, the, it's it's a it's an unusual and very very powerful, amazing film. You should take your time to sit to you know take it in, and it's thirty minutes, a little bit more than thirty minutes. So, uh, can you maybe say something about um, because it's not just the, your voice; it's also these other sounds. There is a there is a. <coughs> There are other animal sounds. There are, of course, drums. There are, you know, the sounds of galloping horses and things like that. So, I, 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 I'm struck the more I've seen the film by the kind of the richness of this film. Um, maybe you don't want to. No, no. I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just. I feel. I feel that my understanding of sound has improved so much since then to now that, uh, but so it's hard to talk about you know what uh, I think the only thing I mean it's 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 uh, much better to see and to hear for yourselves than for me to describe it in a way. Uh, the I mean the only thing I would say in terms of sound and say not in terms of not in not in what I'm saying. Uh, but um, if you, s in, in the content of what I'm saying or trying to say, 
you would notice uh, that there, there are shifts that take place between um, various uh, psychological spaces. Uh, and um, I am in a way looking at a certain question from different points, sometimes within, sometimes outside, sometimes top, sometimes below, sometimes inside, sometimes outside, sometimes inside, sometimes, sometimes very close, sometimes very, you know, stepping back. And what you find is that sometimes you step back and you actually get closer to something. Uh, you know, you don't, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you go for something, uh, it's not necessary that you are going to get it. Uh, so, um, uh, um, how do you move from something deeply intimate to something actually quite uh, restrained and, and, and uh, uh, withdrawn? Um, yeah, and so on. So, uh, there are many such, uh, in a sense, um, methods in, in, in the narrative. In the spoken narrative, in the visual narrative as well, and therefore also in the sound. Uh, so, the, the sound design and the sound composition <coughs> also kind of complements this way in which uh, um, you, uh, um, you enter a kind of, a, you know, a, a, a territory of sounds of various kinds uh, and of various uh, volumes and which in a sense you of, of perspective in sound as well. So, uh, it, they are not sounds that you hear at one, in one perspective, you hear them at different. And essentially what I feel is that the reason why uh, I was trying to do that is that uh, there are more ways to understand than just with your mind. And uh, so, how, um, you know, how, how do we open little doors, little routes into preparing ourselves to be in a condition uh, so that we may be able to uh, attempt to understand what is happening around, what is happening within. So, it is more about preparing yourself to be able to understand. And <clears throat> maybe that uh, allows me to maybe uh, conclude this uh, first part, but, bec uh, but I would like to refer to what uh, you just said, Amar, this, this really this, this big dilemma between, uh, or more than that, it's actually there is a, a kind of a dialectic relationship between violence and nonviolence. You know, Gandhi uh, was very aware, or he became very aware, that in order to practice nonviolence, in order to um, really become uh, satyagrahi, he called these people. You know, satyagraha is uh, uh, is what the, is what's the term he coined for this. Uh, you need to understand violence, and you need to be able to actually uh, even endure it. You know, you ca if because it's hard. You know, if someone really starts beating you, abusing you, even killing you, I mean, it's hard to not fight back. And so there is a, a very uh, sort of difficult uh, sort of dilemma or point where violence and nonviolence are very deeply connected. There are, you know, uh, objects in this exhibition, films. Uh, there is, a, you know, the video of the tank man, the man who uh, opposed the tanks, uh, uh, who, you know, the tanks who went, uh, that went to the Tiananmen Square, that, that moment. Uh, is, is in the show. Uh, so there is always this kind of um, transition between violence and nonviolence. And, I, uh, I, and this piece, this film, and the struggling, the, the, the narrative uh, of uh, Amar's uh, spoken word um, sort of uh, shows this, this dilemma in a very, in a very powerful way. So. <coughs> Maybe it's time for, for questions. I um, invite you to, to ask uh, Amar or me any, any questions you might have. Yes. Since I haven't seen the film, uh, but I look forward to seeing it, to what extent were you, or how explicitly were you 
interpreting these things through Gandhi's uh, writings and his life? Uh, were you, how would Gandhi see this? Or were you, was it in the foreground or in the background? Actually quite intensely, uh, in the sense that um, when I was working and researching on this at that time, I also, um, uh, you know, I found that um, as we were talking yesterday that um, for somebody to take this position at the time, uh, you know, in the first half uh, uh, between say, you know, all the way up to the 1940s, to be taking this position of nonviolence. Um, he invited an extremely uh, large array of criticism. Uh, he was criticized, I mean, he may be criticized now as well, but he was criticized quite relentlessly uh, at that time, uh, even as his following in, increased. And he was criticized by um, all types of people. Uh, learned people, religious people, politicians, his colleagues, his, his, his party men, as well as just about anybody, the man on the street as well. Some of these criticisms were very incisive. Um, uh, some of them were purely religious, some of them were uh, uh, philosophical and some practical and some also very stupid. Um, and um, what he did was that if you look at his life over a period of time, you find that through a variety of publications, uh, magazines, publications, newspapers, books, and occasions of, of, of you know, uh, talking, but uh, communicating, what he did was that he formally replied to these criticisms continuously. Even if his, there were contradictions in earlier positions, he addressed those. If somebody pointed out a contradiction, he would address his own contradiction. But he re replied in writing. So if somebody attacked him personally, he would reply. Somebody attacked him politically, he would reply and so on. However silly it may be. Uh, if you, what I did to answer your question specifically was that uh, uh, researching these responses, over a period of time, uh, I actually found that these responses uh, had a kind of a, uh, a synergy or a relationship with all the questions that I was asking of myself as well. Uh, and all the answers, all, you know, I was critiquing myself for while I was looking at the question of violence and nonviolence with a range of questions. And these questions were the questions that actually had been unfurled at him over a period of time and that he had responded to them. So uh, I found answers personally and I also found answers in these writings. And by looking at these responses as his responses practically as well as in writing over a period of time actually helped to structure this film. So at the very beginning, uh, uh, you know, soon when he starts talking, he brings Gandhi, uh, and it's one of these, one of these exactly, one of these very insightful dialogues between Gandhi and the British colonialists and how Gandhi they they crit, you know they make they, uh, look him kind of or ma try to make him kind of ridiculous with his concept of nonviolence. It's very interesting what he says, Gandhi. Very polite, but very yeah. So. Gandhi uh, does come up very at the very beginning yeah. of the film. And also, the one, just one thing is that, you know, we are all, all of us are also too exhausted of having a, uh, a superior figure, knowledgeable figure. Uh, and then what he has to say is pumped into you, you know, uh, uh, whoever it is, you know, any ideologue or any, uh, and uh, it sometimes you can get fed up of being, you know, given the good stuff uh, over and over again, you know, as a kid as well. And uh, so, in some senses, as you will see, I, I, uh, I'm also uh, displacing this. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to the guru to seek his, 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 uh, you know, his wisdom. Uh, I'm, uh, he's uh, uh, until to until the end, and even when I get into the end, I'm actually interrogating him. I'm confronting him. Uh, and the, the Tibetan monk, you mean? Or you see, uh, that's what I'm saying. That uh, you um, you may think I'm interrogating a Tibetan monk, uh, 
but uh, yeah, as you see the words and as you see it moves, uh, you know, who is this monk? Mm -hmm. You know, is he Tibetan? Is he not Tibetan? And is he is he is he real? And is he real? Is he not real? Is he Gandhi? Is he not Gandhi? And so on. And it's an interrogation. So I am not necessarily taking this. You know, I'm not taking this as a servile position of give me knowledge. You know, uh, but I'm still arguing. I'm arguing and arguing and arguing. And 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 we go through these arguments uh, together in a way. So, uh, but it is Gandhi really. Uh. Thank you. I'd be interested in knowing uh, what you're doing currently, and also perhaps if you could say uh, how your notion and your take on nonviolence has evolved and how, what it is today. And also perhaps if you could give us a word on what the uh, Menin uh, collection is, that for those of us who don't know. Um, <coughs> what I'm doing now and uh, see, very briefly, uh, uh, if you were to travel in the subcontinent uh, at any point, if you were to in the last 10 years or even today, uh, you would actually run into a, uh, an quite an incredible number of um, people uh, collectively and individually. Uh, engaged in the most unbelievably heroic nonviolent struggles. Uh, you will have a, you can find a two villages uh, or ten villages uh, of uh, indigenous communities of poor farmers. Uh, uh, fighting non-violently, a cartel of the biggest international companies uh, across the world with all their might supported with the police, local police, all the political parties supporting them, every single you know thing supporting that the corporation. supporting the corporations yeah. and you can find uh, you know a set of six villages or eight villages holding out. Uh, and holding their land in some way or the other desperately but non-violently for not one year, not two years, but seven years, ten years, nine years, twelve years. Um, you can find uh, uh, you know a, a, a woman um, like Iram Sharmila in the northeast part of, of the country who is on a fast for more than ten years against uh, a military law. Uh, so she has not eaten for ten years in 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 um, in protest. Uh, so uh, and she's been forced. She's fed. she's she's repeatedly arrested and repeatedly force fed uh, through a drip. Um, and um, but yes, it has been more than a decade, and 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 uh, it uh, it uh, it has been several decades since this particular region ha is under military law. Um, now, um, you go, uh, you, you know, I could give you more and more uh, instances of this. So, at one level, you could say that uh, you have a military uh, uh, law uh, being imposed on a certain uh, community or a certain uh, region uh, for five decades now, uh, which actually gives uh, the army and the state, the power to arrest, the power to enter without warrant, without uh, you know, I mean, it gives impunity to an entire uh, apparatus. Uh, and you have a woman who is uh, fighting in this incredible way with many other people, but as a single solitary kind of position for such a long time. You could look at this as a failure, or you could look at it as a success could look at it as to how somebody is willing, uh, is capable of fighting and how that somebody is inspiring a whole generation to continue to fight in this manner or you could say that it is a failure if she has not managed to get the law repealed. Likewise, in all the instances you can, you can look at it in both ways. I would actually look at it as a success um, because it is no joke to to do that it is no joke to hold back you know eight of the most powerful corporations in the world for 10 years to just protect your piece of land 
and they are unable to move and they are unable to mine, they are unable to take it over. So, in, in a way, uh, how has my understanding changed or what have I learnt more? I mean, there is uh, uh, essentially, uh, there is enough evidence and more and more evidence of innovations, newer and newer methods that communities, pe people have taken this whole argument or this whole position of Gandhi far, far ahead and there is a lot to learn. Uh, in terms of trying to pre um, uh, precisely answer to what I am doing now, I mean it is a, uh, what I have been doing, um, it is a lot to talk about, uh, but I think I would just try to get to the to the essence of it rather than to describe the current work that I am doing and have been doing. And I would simply say that over the years, uh, in a way what uh, I have, I felt was that we were witnessing perhaps, um, you know, the repetition of crime. Uh, and. Uh, Maybe we are comfortable with understanding violence if you have an army that goes in or a plane that goes in and bombs a set of people, we can understand that. Uh, would we be, if I put a poison in your glass and give it to you and you die, and maybe you will say that that is, yeah, immediate, it's clear, it is violence and I have killed you. Uh, but if I, if I were to put poison in your glass and of water and you, it takes you 10 years to die, then how would you understand? Would you understand that as violence? Would you not understand that as violence and so on? So, in a way, um, what I felt uh, over the years and recently was that uh, perhaps uh, even though crime is quite visible and we have enough evidence to prove the crime. There is, there is no shortage of evidence around us, uh, but in spite of the fact that there is enough evidence available, uh, the crimes continue. So, uh, you know, how do you address this issue and is that, is it, does it mean that we are not unable to see the crime? Uh, does it mean that we approve of the crime? Does it mean that we are unable to look at um, uh, access the evidence, uh, but it is you know uh, how do you uh, you know how do you resolve this and so um, a, you know a set of smaller propositions which is that it seems maybe perhaps that maybe we are not understanding the crime. And well we are made maybe to not understand the crime, I mean many of the cases you are talking about very few of us even know about. I mean, uh, there's many, many, many things happening in this part of the world. And Amar has traveled for decades now and documented. And to answer your question, his work has been about exactly this. So he has been showing works about uh, Burmese, uh, you know, Myanmar, the situation in Myanmar, and, and many other uh, areas in, in, the, in or cases in that area. May I just answer your question about the Manil Collection very uh, briefly? It's a, uh, the Manil Collection is a museum founded by two French people who were um, uh, immigrants to the U.S. after the, they left, uh, they fled France because of the Nazi invasion. They became um, wealthy and they founded um, a foundation that was um, about whose principles were about tolerance, about supporting education, about against uh, you know, discrimination and to, uh, call, uh, to create a very significant collection of art. And so we, we the, uh, the museum, the Manil Collection opened in 1987 and it is a very famous building. It's one of, considered to be one of the best museums really. The first really great building by Renzo Piano, the architect. And, but it's a, it's a whole set of, in the meantime, it's a campus in, the city, in this strange city of Houston. I'm not, you know, I never thought I would live there, but it's a very interesting city. Um, a very contemporary, very crazy. And, but it's a very beautiful institution that um, has now, uh, is comprised of several buildings. Also the Rothko Chapel is famous. The Rothko Chapel is, is a place of, uh, uh, human rights programs uh, and 
So for me to do this show was because the place was so right. Uh, so that's just, in, but you can look it up. And yeah, there were other people. There was someone, sorry, behind you first. Was your film allowed to be shown in Pakistan? And if yes, how was the reaction? Second question, was your film also shown in other uh, current um, warring country situation? And if yes, how was the reaction there? Thank you. This particular film, the one we are talking about, um, yes, uh, the film was shown in Pakistan. Um, I didn't get um, a visa to, to go uh, uh, in, uh, but the film went. And, um, um, and uh, I think um, when you see the film, towards the end of the film, you see that uh, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the other side of the, uh, of the border and um, there is somebody who is, uh, I don't want to describe it, but there is somebody on the other side mouthing. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to lip read him. Uh, and um, so, you know, I mean, uh, there has been a positive response, no doubt. I mean, we are really one type of people. We are one people in a way, you know, maybe, maybe we have some differences, and, but essentially the, it's too intertwined, our insides. Uh, so uh, the, the, re the response has been positive uh, and it was also interesting to get response from the other side, so to speak. Uh, which I also got. Um, in terms of uh, other uh, countries uh, which are in conflict, or uh, it, it, the film has actually shown in many, many, many countries, uh, which have um, even before, uh, you know, Documenta 2002, uh, in countries that are in conflict, and um, at, uh, you know, again, how was the response? Uh, I'd say that it actually, this film taught me many things. Uh, and one of the things that it taught me was that um, uh, it really doesn't matter where you show. Uh, you know, I, earlier I would understand audiences differently. Like I would say a Colombian audience it would be a certain kind, an Indian village audience would be a certain kind. And you know, an Israeli audience would be a certain kind, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, you know, I, I found that it it doesn't work like that. Uh, of course, there are specificities uh, to every situation, but by and large, people relate quite similarly. Mm -hmm. And um, there are there are many personal things as well inside the film. So you know, you can just relate to the to the bird and the crow. Uh, as well, rather than geopolitics. You know.